Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Olumide Macaulay. Hello and welcome. Tonight, former Minister of Agriculture Akumumi Adishino is re-elected President of African Development Bank for another five years. President Mohamed Buhari congratulates Mr. Akumumi Adishino, encourages him to be steadfast to better the lives of Africans. Federal government postpones resumption of international flights till September the 5th. Boko Haram insurgents kill at least 14 people in Lake Chad border community between Nigeria and Cameroon. And Hurricane Laura strikes U.S. state of Louisiana, causing flash floods, severe damage to lives and property. Plus, business, sports, and later, from our studios in London. On business news tonight, Central Bank to resume weekly forex sales to Bureau de Change operators from August the 31st, ahead of international flight resumption next week. Sports News, the Electoral Committee in charge of the Ivorian Football Federation election declares DDA Drogba ineligible to contest next month's presidential polls. Mr. Akiwumi Adeshino, Nigeria's former Minister of Agriculture, has been re-elected as the President of the African Development Bank for another five-year term. Mr. Adeshino, who was elected by the bank's Board of Governors today during the annual meeting held virtually, announced that his re-election spells a new dawn for the bank's service delivery to the continent. He says he will continue the implementation of his high five priorities, projects geared towards improving electricity, food security, financing, transport, as well as water and sanitation across African countries. <laughs> Mr. Akiwumi Adeshino's announcement as the president of the African Development Bank to run Together, another five-year term came with huge talk. excitement, <laughs> owing to several reforms for the continent's economies through the bank. Mr. Adeshino, Nigeria's former Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, focused on five development priorities known as the High Fives, which had Light Up and Power Africa, Feed Africa, Industrialize Africa, integrate Africa and improve the quality of life for the people of Africa. You Shortly after his re-election during the bank's 55th annual meeting, Mr. Adeshino highlights the resolution with the Board of Governors on how to get Africa out of the devastation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We discuss ways in which the bank will support Africa to rebuild better and stronger from the effects of COVID-19 pandemic. We discuss how to further strengthen our institution, deepen our governance and accountability systems. We discuss many more, regional trade, regional integration, climate, gender, youth and jobs, and of course, debt sustainability, and how to focus on quality health infrastructure to build economic resilience for Africa. Last year, the bank's shareholders increased its authorized capital base for a historic $115 billion, the largest in the bank's 55-year history. Mr. Adeshina is calling for more support. Myself and the board of directors, senior management and staff of the bank will need each and every one of you, our shareholders, collectively in support for the bank to play this leadership role. He goes on to After thank the bank's trained, board of governors for their support in studying the bank during the leadership crisis to owing to their belief in his vision. You strengthened the bank. You reinforced our collective vision. You decided for continuity to build on what we have achieved together over the past five years. I look forward to working closely with each and every one of you for the urgent and difficult task of supporting Africa to build back better, smarter, 
and boldly from the COVID-19 pandemic. As Mr. Adeshino tasks the bank and staff for more selfless rest. service to Africa and the, the bank, the expectations of the continent and the rest of the world will be that the bank will continue to be the backbone of Africa's development through its various interventions. Meanwhile, Mr. Adeshino's re-election is a joy to behold for President Mohamed Buhari as he sends a congratulatory message to the re-elected AFDB president and appreciation to the African Union, including shareholders of the bank, for endorsing Mr. Adeshino's re-election. The president's comments reads in part, Mr. Adeshino's versatility, experience at both national and international engagements, will be further deployed to energize the Pan-African financial institution urging him to remain focused and steadfast in pursuing the noble goals of making life better for Africans through various developmental plans, already captured as high fives. President Mohamed Buhari also encouraged the re-elected AFDB president to remain focused and steadfast in pursuing the noble goals of making life better for Africans through various development plans. More congratulatory messages are pouring in for Mr. Adeshino. The latest from the Senate President Ahmed Lawan in his words says, Your re-election shall be an impetus for taking the continental financial institution to a greater height, realizing that the reward for hard work is more work. For the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Badabi Amila, Mr. Adeshino's re-election is a triumph of integrity and dedication to duty. He said, As I congratulate you on this historic milestone with the belief that the bank is in good hands, this is to remind you that your re-election is a call to rededicate yourself to duty towards positioning the bank as a global financial institution to reckon with. The governor of Ogun State is not left out as he described Dr. Adeshino as a brand ambassador for Ogun State and a man reputed for exceptional leadership. He said Dr. Adeshino is one world-class public servant and intellectual that puts a human face to the ex execution of poor, poor strategies that would impact on the development agenda of the continent. I am proud of his re-election and sure that Africa will be better managed now as he has the wherewithal to address challenges that stare us in the face in the post-COVID era. For the Lagos State Governor, Mr. Babajide Somolu, Mr. Adeshina's re-election is well as he has distinguished himself during his first term in office as the head of the international organization. He says, having proven yourself as a good administrator and technocrat, in different public offices at the national and international levels in the last 30 years, I'm confident that your re-election will bring more development to the African continent as you supervise the affairs of the African Development Bank for another five years. Let's now get some more insight on Mr. Adeshino's re-election. Earlier, I spoke with renowned economist and CEO of financial derivatives, Mr. Bismarck Ruani. I started by asking him about his immediate reaction to the re-election of Dr. Adeshino as the president of the AFDB. The meaning of this uh, victory of, for Africa is that the reputation of Africans for having an image of corruption, an image of uh, being allergic to transparency, incompetent and corrupt, has been pushed, put aside once and for all. This victory is a victory for Africa and in particular Nigeria for having to dealing with the reputational uh, angle uh, and stereotypes that we have won. But that is only one part of it. The second part of it is the ideological, um, the ideological angle. Ideologically, uh, Africa is supposed to be not only incompetent, but to be dependent. There's a dependency complex as stated clearly by Manoni in his book. And so I'm not surprised that the first action of uh, additional in the second term was to uh, ensure that the next you know, African Development Bank is in Accra, Ghana. Why is that important? Because the book by Nkrumah, Neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism, is very important in the struggle for liberation of Africans from the shackles of disease, ignorance, and the images of reputation. It also goes further and strengthened by the work of Franz Fanon, uh, which is called the Wretched of the Earth. So I think that ideological thing about economic patriotism of Africa and Africa being independent, not just independent in terms of uh, political independence, but economic and ideological independence. I think that's the second angle. Then the philosophical angle is that what is additional 
what does additional victory and continued uh, steadfast upholding on the values of transparency and uh, integrity, what does it mean? It means that additional uh, administration will have to rely fully on the intellectual property of the, of the bank and Africa and Nigeria. I will have to deal with some very, very important challenges. One being the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which actually means that a continent of 1 billion people with about $2 billion and with a with an income per capita of $2,000, will have to come of age and be competitive. We, we shouldn't forget that it took China and the East Asian Tigers 30 years to catch up with the West and overtake them. I think in this, in this, in this current period, Africa can do that in maybe 10 years. Addition has achieved AAA rating, investment grade rating from all the multilateral rating agencies, Moody's, Fitch, Standard & Poor's, so we have to sustain this. And this is not a victory, a one point victory. It's a, it's a challenge that the deepening the institution, institutionalizing the principles of um, transparency and accountability, and making sure that the reputation, the damaged reputation of Africa and Nigeria in particular is repaired. I think it's also um, good to understand that the backing of the Nigerian government and the 54 African countries in this re-election, he had 100% of the votes of all members, both regional and non-regional, which means that African countries have come of age. They now know what it means to be to, the meaning of economic diplomacy, and in knowing that if you don't do anything for yourself, nobody else will do it for you. So, what is going to happen? We are going to engage um, China. We are going to engage Japan. We are going to engage United States, and in the new multilateral world, as against the bilateral world that we are in. And with the COVID experiment, I think that this, this is the beginning of a good day for, this is a good new day for Africa. What would you describe as his major achievements in the last five years? First and foremost, increasing the capital of the bank, achieving investment grade rating. Thirdly, achieving economic independence. Like again, let's go back to what I said, the ideological independence, which was a battle, the battle by non-regional members to make him and Africans who are patriotic to succumb to the wishes and the caprices of the non-regional members to restore or reinstate the uh, principles of neocolonialism, and the, which is the last stage of imperialism. He has been able to fight that battle. That battle is bigger than every other battle because if economic success without ideological freedom is no use to anybody. You can see that what's happening today, even in the Black Lives Matter and the liberation of Africa. So whether we like it or not, that was the major, major achievement. What do you think he should focus on now towards establishing his legacy in the bank? One is that he must continue to understand that he is under observation. Everybody wants to see whether the African, the Nigerian, can stay away from the temptation of being corrupt and, and lack of integrity. So he has to keep that. So that image is one. Number two is how to use financial resources to as a catalyst for development of the type that Africa needs. We cannot just import other models. We have to have a kind of African Afrocentric, Afrocentric uh, economic model that will allow us lower the the the. The, the, the bar, but also achieve a higher standard. Lower the barriers to entry, but achieve a higher performance level. I think that is what it is, and it's not, it's, it's not gonna happen in one day, but I think uh, Ken Adishna has his work cut out for him. I think he has the capacity, he has the intellect, he has the determination, and more than anything else, he has the psychological makeup that will make him achieve this goal. So again, all I can say is congratulations to Nigeria and Ken Adishna for this feat. Thank you so much, Mr. Bismarck Ruwani, the CEO of Financial Derivatives Company, for speaking with us on the News at 10. Thank you. In part two after the break, the federal government postpones resumption of international flights till September the 5th. Please stay with us.
Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Former Minister of Agriculture, Akumi Adishino, is re-elected as President of African Development Bank for another five years. Federal Government postpones resumption of international flights till September the 5th. Boko Haram insurgents kill at least 14 people in Lake Chad border community between Nigeria and Cameroon. And Hurricane Laura strikes U.S. state of Louisiana, causing flash flooding, severe damage to lives and property. Our website, ChannelsTV.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using a mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV and Roku. For many of those who have been waiting anxiously for international flight operations to resume this Saturday, they'll have to wait for one more week. As the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 says August the 30th is no longer feasible due to logistics challenges. The Director General of the Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority, Musa Nuhu, today announced a new date of September the 5th for the reopening of the airspace for international flights. Meanwhile, the task force has also launched an online portal to keep track of all its finances and spendings. These, among others, are the highlights from the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 public hearing today. International travelers coming or going out of Nigeria will have to wait until September 5th, as the government says it is no longer feasible to open the airspace for international flights at the end of this month. Since the announcement by the Honorable Minister of Aviation a few weeks ago, the international flights will resume from the, any time from the 29th of August. The uh, aviation sector has worked assiduously to be ready for this date. However, we have other non-aviation logistics who are still working out, uh, mostly to do with the uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, protocols. So for this reason, unfortunately, I have to uh, let you know the uh, resumption date has been shifted by one week to 5th of September. Having eradicated the wild polio virus, the Minister of Health says most of the resources used will now be redeployed for the COVID-19 response. We shall be deploying the material and human resource assets from the polio eradication effort to surveillance and fighting other disease outbreaks including the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. The task force has also launched an online portal, which it says will enable the public to track its finances and expenditure. The PTF has been tracking donations and technical assistance received from individuals, groups, and various national and international organizations. These donations, alongside the disbursements across the Federation, have been documented and are now open for everyone to see through the activation of these dashboards, which are now accessible on the PTF website. What this presupposes is that you don't even have to ask anybody. Just access the website and you have every information that you need. And you will be able to track what we have received what has been uploaded on the dashboard, where it has gone to. If we say we have received 1,000 PPEs or 200 ventilators, you'll be able to track where these 200 ventilators have gone to. It is exactly six months since February 27th this year when the first COVID-19 case in Nigeria was diagnosed. While Nigeria has received several commendations from the international community about her case management strategy, the massive disregard for the non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as the use of face masks, remain a major impediment 
to various efforts at breaking the chain of transmission. To security matters, there are reports of a deadly attack by ISWAP terrorists on a Cameroonian island near the Lake Chad border with Nigeria, where at least 14 persons are said to have been killed. The insurgents are reportedly, they reportedly landed on the island of Bulgadum aboard speedboats from an enclave on the Nigerian side while people were preparing for the evening prayer. Some of the victims are said to have been shot in their homes, while others were killed in the mosque where they'd gone to pray. The AFP reports that the attack follows the blockage of food supplies to the insurgents by security forces from the Nigerian side. Other sources said local chiefs of the town had invoked the Quran at a town hall meeting and placed a curse on any resident allowing supplies to the jihadists, an action which the insurgents reportedly consider as a show of support for the local authorities. The Nigerian military has been reporting series of airstrikes against the insurgents in the past weeks, with the most recent being an attack on the strongholds of the insurgents on the fringes of the Lake Chad region, where the military claimed it killed several ISWAP leaders. Also concerning security in Oyo State, Governor Shei Makinde has declared that security of lives and property in the state remains extremely important to his government, and that the state security network codenamed Operation Amotekun has come to stay. The governor made the comments while addressing chairpersons of the 68 local government and local council development areas in the state. He explains that the security outfit will not be under the control of the federal establishments, but the state. We must do everything possible. Every other thing is resting on a safe and secure environment. Uh, I'll say okay or the other day. Uh, uh, our brothers went and robbed the bank, and thankfully uh, the uh, uh, the community rose to the uh, occasion, and uh, uh, they assisted to uh, uh, to apprehend uh, those people, and they come before it. And that is why I'll continue to say, and I'm saying it for the whole world to hear, uh, Amateko is here to stay with us. And he will not be under the control of the federal establishment. He will be under our control. Security of our people is extremely important. Nothing can take place uh, as far as we are concerned in uh, our process of insecurity. From security to politics, it's two days before the Ebonyi local government elections and the ruling People's Democratic Party is optimistic that the election is another opportunity to confirm its dominance in the state. Ahead of the polls, the party held a rally today in Abakaliki, the state capital, with the state governor, Dave Umahi, as chief host. <laughs> Jubilant party members gather at the township stadium in Apakali Kibiebon state capital for what they call the grand finale of campaigns ahead of the local government elections in the state. It is an uncommon political event for a grassroots election bearing all the elements of a mega rally with music, dance and party bigwigs in attendance. The PDP won all 13 chairmanship and 171 councillorship seats in the local government election held in 2017. And for this forthcoming one, Governor David Dumai is confident that the party can retain its winning ways. I'm very confident that in the councillorship election, we will return 100%. Yes, sir. We are not writing results. We have done quite a lot to warrant more than 100% at the various levels. The chairmen are going to be returned 100%. Other PDP chieftains at the event also commend the state government for its achievement so far. We arrived at Boeing and we saw the beautiful projects 
and we saw the accomplishments of the government. And I can tell you that miracles, if you have not seen miracles anywhere, you can see miracles here in the joint. We met with the governor and we asked, I asked for only question, one question. I said, Mr. Governor, where is your own money coming from? <laughs> Candidates of the People's Democratic Party have been on campaign trail for the past two weeks in their different local governments for an election expected to be conducted across the 13 local government areas of the state. When the news at 10 returns, Central Bank of Nigeria to resume weekly forex sales to bureau de change operators ahead of international flight resumption. That's on Business News. Please join us again. Welcome back. In politics, preparations continue for next month's governorship election in Edo State, with the candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Pastor Sage Zeyamu, reiterating that social welfare, infrastructure, and human capital development are some of the areas that will top his administration's priority if elected into office. He stated this during the APC's governorship campaign rallies across the wards of Owen West local government area of the state. Ozala clan in Owa West local government welcomes the APC governorship campaign team for its local government ward rally. The rally provides an opportunity for the predominantly farming population to reel out their expectations. The thing when they want for a place, water, road, school, hospital. My community will not get water. We not get better road. We not get road. We not get sweet sweet road. The APC governorship candidate, Pastor Sage Izeyamu, promises to do more, especially in the area of infrastructure and social welfare for the people. The question is, what do you want to continue? You want to make our suffering continue? You want to make our neglect continue? Who does say God forbid? God forbid! Who does say God forbid? God forbid! God forbid. So, in for social development, we will provide hospital, we will provide lights, we will provide water, we will provide good drinks. From Ozala, the next port of call is Sabu Gidaura, then Sobe Town. From war to war, the APC and its governorship candidate continue to engage different audiences for the same message full of promise of a better future. God will really use me. Take wipe away the tears of all our people, whether men or women. You know, Bible say Proverbs 29 verse 2. It says, when the righteous are in authority. He said, the people rejoice. He said, when the wicked bear it true, the people fall. The APC governorship campaign train continues to engage the Edo people with its program manifesto, The Simple Agenda, which it believes is a good roadmap for rapid development of the state. Meanwhile, for the serving governor of Edo state and candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Godwin Obasiki, the developmental strides of his government is already yielding dividends. Governor Basiki says the state government has received a 40 billion naira World Bank Education Grant as reward for its efforts in transforming the education sector. He was speaking at the Palace of the Traditional Ruler during the PDP campaign tour of Ovia Southwest local government area. 
the elaborate of Hussein Oba Olubwe the second and his cabinet file out to receive the PDP's governorship candidate, Mr. Godwin Obasaki, and his entourage in his palace. The PDP delegation is here to get support for Governor Governor Obasaki's re-election bid. Your Royal Highness. For Governor Obasaki, the palace we is a good place to start the campaign. He reads out some developmental strides by his administration, including a World Bank grant. The board of the World Bank approved a $75 million facility for Edo State Government to use in strengthening its educational system. What that means is that over the next three years, I'll have about 40 billion naira to utilize in changing the face of education in Edo and in Nigeria. While granting approval for electioneering, the real father is told Mr. Basaki's leadership style. You are a good governor. I know that you don't talk too much, which I always tell people. And these are the kind of people I like, who don't talk, but you see their performances. Who saying is there for you, day and night? I still repeat it. We are there, and God will go to support us. <laughs> Done with the palace is straight to the rallies. The PDP insists that Governor Basaki's success story is through divine intervention and cannot be attributed to any individual. The governor is on a divine mission, a mission that will free a state from the control of one man. A mission that will bring development to a adult state. And no one can stop him. Your son, the deputy governor. The deputy governorship candidate, Philip Shaibu, shows his versatility in languages. Another day, another local government area covered. The PDP campaign trail moves on. They believe that their campaign promises will remain in the minds of the people as they do decide on September 19. Away from Edo State, the COVID-19 pandemic might have impacted the demand for oil and further exposed Nigeria's over-dependency on crude oil earnings, but lessons from the pandemic can be applied to intensify efforts towards diversifying the economy through the promotion of non-oil exports. This was a thrust of thoughts that emerged from deliberations during a webinar organized by Zenith Bank. The bank's annual seminar is an initiative to deepen the discourse on promoting non-oil export business in Nigeria. We have a few of a, a couple of Zenith Bank people on the platform. This so webinar, organized by Zenith Bank, is said to be in the best interest of the country. And uh, these questions me, set the tone for the discourse. Uh, Thoughts you, the MD CEO of Zenith Bank feels needs today. to be addressed uh, in the wake of changes forced by a COVID-19 pandemic. He believes all the forms of export must take precedence. What if oil dries up? What if there is no oil for Nigeria to explore? And the only response we had was that we have no choice but to go back to our natural endowment. For me, there are two things to do to deal with Nigerian foreign exchange uh, challenges. First is that we need to change our taste board. Two is that we need to now begin to explore and do a lot more of export. In agreement is the director in charge of exchange and trade of the central bank, who feels there needs to be a genuine effort to reduce dependency on oil. Optimal attention should be given to sectors such as manufacturing, agriculture, information technology, and most importantly, the SME sector. The Nigerian Export Promotion Council is an agency charged with the responsibility of promoting non-oil export in Nigeria. The man at the helm of affairs says there is no going back on the zero oil agenda. We need to boost our 
uh, our uh, SMEs, MSMEs, large factories, so we can dominate Africa rather than become a dumping ground. Because you see, all these countries are going to be doing things and the market they're going to be looking for is Nigeria. On how agriculture can get into the mix, the MD CEO of the Nigeria Risk Sharing for Agriculture Lending lists a few pointers in this regard. We provide technical assistance in terms of capacity building, uh, training, a lot of things to ensure that when you go to Zenith, almost all their requirements are pre-met. Two, in some cases, what NASA does is also to do a direct investment as a proof of concept for any key segment of the value chain we believe can work so that we kind of present a food is ready uh, scenario to the banks uh, with numbers and everything. Thinking outside the box, as this webinar has shown, since the emergence of COVID-19 is important, as diversifying Nigeria's potential must just lead to good fortunes. Human rights lawyer Mr. Femi Falano is asking the Central Bank of Nigeria to furnish him with information on how a purported 338 billion naira COVID-19 intervention fund was spent. Mr. Falano said in a letter to the CBN that the request was made in line with Section 1 of the Freedom of Information Act. He says the letter is in reaction to a report detailing the disbursement of the said funds across various sectors in Nigeria without capturing the details of the beneficiaries. The letter further demanded for a response to the request within seven days, failure of which it says the Apex Bank may have to face a legal suit. The Kanu State Governor Abdullahi Ganduje says he will append his signature to the death sentence passed on a 22-year-old 20 year man, Aminu Yahaya Sharif, for blasphemy. The presiding judge on the matter, Aliyu Kani, has said his judgment of August the 10th was based on Section 32. 382, subsection B of the Kanu Sharia Penal Code of 2000. Governor Ganduje condemned Aminu Yahaya's comments as irresponsible and that the security implications of the statement is one that could heat up the polity. The man in question had earlier confessed to being a follower of a particular Islamic sect, but the adherents of that sect appears to have rejected him, with scholars terming Aminu Yahaya Sharif as one who just decided to derail. Now let's get down to brass tacks of business news. Here's Anne Wawodo. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Olumide. Hello and welcome to business news. Nigeria's central bank says that it will resume weekly sale of foreign currencies to bureau de change operators with effect from August the 31st. In a statement released today, the financial market regulator explains that its decision to resume FX sales to BDCs is to allow air travelers more access to Forex ahead of the resumption of international flights in the country on September the 5th. The CBN further mentions that Forex sales to BDCs will hold on Mondays and Wednesdays with volume of sale to each market put at $10,000, while BDC operators are not expected to exchange the Naira at more than 386 Naira to a dollar. Nigeria may fall into recession in the third quarter of this year due to the heavy impact of low oil prices and the coronavirus on the economy, and that's according to the Director General of the Budget Office, Mr. Ben Akabueze. He told reporters today that the GDP growth is expected to drop further in the third quarter of this year, which will be the second quarter of negative growth after the economy contracted by 6.1% in the second quarter of the year. About two weeks ago, the Minister of Finance warned that the country may slide into another recession unless, of course, it achieves a very strong third quarter 2020 performance. Nigeria's economy went into recession for the first time in 25 years back in 2016. And still talking about Nigeria's economy, it is still witnessing a shake from the COVID-19 pandemic as the manufacturing sector contracted for a fourth consecutive month. The Purchasing Managers Index survey report for the month of August released by the Central Bank shows the manufacturing PMI stood at 48.5 index points is against 44.9 points recorded in the month of August. It also adds that six out of the 14 subsectors surveyed reported expansion above 50 percent 
while the remaining eight reported a contraction. Meanwhile, the composite PMI for the non-manufacturing sector currently stands at 44.7 points, indicating a contraction for the fifth consecutive month, with 16 out of the 17 subsectors reporting a contraction. One of South Africa's biggest steel producers, Accelerometal, has declared force majeure after a breakdown of a bland furnace, blast furnace at the Newcastle Works in KwaZulu-Natal province of South Africa. And this is coming as the steel and mining giant mentions that demand was at its lowest before the COVID-19 pandemic, while it experienced a difficulty in exports after governments around the world enforced strict measures to contain the spread of the virus. The industry is the biggest steel maker in Africa, producing close to 4.4 million tons of finished steel products in South Africa via four main steel plants. Well, despite an improved turnover of shares transactions, the local stock market has fallen in negative territory today after a week-long positive trend. Let's hear more from Layo Adigoki. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. The sixth consecutive day rally recorded at the equities market came to a slight halt today with a 10 basis points decline in the all share index. This is because investors switched to a profit taking mode on some key industrial and banking sector stocks such as Dangote Cement, Lafarge Africa, Axis and Zenith Bank. And this led to a 13.48 billion naira drop on the market's overall value. However, this does not mean that the market has lost its steam, as traders say that the drop in today's performance is only reflective of sell pressure by short-term investors. Look at this activity chart. Volume of shares traded today were higher by more than 50% compared to Wednesday's session in nearly 3,000 transactions. It's two sessions into the end of August, and we continue to keep our fingers crossed for the market's final direction for the month. And that's the Stock Markets Report. I'm Layo Adegoki. Thank you, Layo. The Dow Jones and the S&P 500 reversed their losses a few minutes before the closing bell today, ending the trading session as the Federal Reserve unveiled a new framework that could actually keep interest rate lower for a longer period of time. But let's find out how major markets ended today. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Umawadu. It's back to you, Lumidi. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Anne. One of the strongest storms ever to hit the U.S. Gulf Coast, Hurricane Laura has struck the state of Louisiana, causing flash floods, Striking severe damage to buildings, and power cuts to at least half a million homes. The state governor, John Edwards, said daylight was only seen for a couple of hours and confirmed the first fatality in his state. He also warned of a chemical fire at an industrial plant in the Lake Charles area, calling on people to shelter in place and close doors and windows. Here's Simon Pusey now with more international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Hurricane Laura has struck the coast of Louisiana with extreme winds causing flash flooding in the US state. The Category 4 hurricane is expected to cause an unsurvivable storm surge as it moves inland with wind speeds of up to 240 km per hour. If it maintains those speeds, it would be one of the strongest storms to ever hit the American Gulf Coast. Half a million residents have been told to leave parts of Texas and Louisiana. More than 390,000 homes in Louisiana reportedly lost power, while in Texas more than 100,000 homes suffered power cuts. The U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has warned that violence will spread in American cities if Joe Biden wins the White House in November.
We've seen violence and chaos. Amid widening protests over the police shooting of the black man Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, Pence and other Republicans have described the November the 3rd election between Trump and Biden as a choice between law and order and lawlessness at their national convention. The hard truth is, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. And under President Trump, we will always stand with those who stand on the thin blue line and we're not going to defund the police, not now, not ever. Meanwhile, numerous athletes have withdrawn from tournaments in protest against racial injustice after the shooting of Jacob Blake on Sunday. In basketball, the NBA has postponed three playoff games after the Milwaukee Bucks called off their fixture. In baseball, three MLB games have been called off after teams decided not to play, and five MLS matches have been postponed. The tennis player Naomi Osaka has also withdrawn from the Western and Southern Open just hours after having booked her spot in the semi-finals. The white supremacist who killed 51 people at two mosques in New Zealand last year has been sentenced to life in jail without parole, the first person in the country's history to receive the sentence. The Australian Brenton Tarrant has admitted to the murder of 51 people, attempted murder of another 40 people and one charge of terrorism. The judge has called Tarrant's actions inhuman and has said he showed no mercy. Tarrant's sentencing also marks the first terrorism conviction in New Zealand's history. French Prime Minister Jean Castex has said that the government must move fast to curb a deadly new COVID-19 wave with infections surging in the Paris region and among young people. France is hoping to avoid a new nationwide lockdown, but the country has been facing a resurgence of new virus infections since July, with an acceleration from mid-August. The government is due to unveil details of the post-pandemic rescue plan to haul the economy out of its deepest slump since World War II next week. Meanwhile, Myanmar has closed schools nationwide as COVID-19 infections have increased there. The country's outbreak has been relatively small compared with other countries in the region, with just six deaths and 574 infections so far. But an increase in cases by nearly 35% in just over a week is causing concern. North Korea has been on high alert as Typhoon Bavi has made landfall, dumping heavy rains and uprooting trees after skirting the coast of South Korea overnight, causing some damage. Leader Kim Jong-un has issued an alert to prevent crop damage and casualties as the country guards against the coronavirus pandemic. Heavy rain earlier this month raised concern about food supplies in the isolated country after inundating hundreds of houses and flooding vast rice-growing lands. The Chinese city of Shenzhen has held light shows and other aerial events to celebrate the 40th anniversary of its special economic zone status. Shenzhen is China's first special economic zone, leading the country's reform and opening up. The four themed chapters of the light show follow the development course of Shenzhen chronologically, depicting economic and social progress and changing images of the region. Seventeen dead dolphins have washed up on Mauritius's shore weeks after an oil spill caused a major ecological disaster in the area. The dolphins have been taken to a research center for an autopsy. In late July, a Japanese bulk carrier ran aground off the coast of the island and began spilling oil a week later. Scientists have said the full impact is unfolding and the damage could affect Mauritius and its tourist-dependent economy for decades. And finally, as Senegal's first female professional surfer, Kaju Sambe has been inspiring the next generation to defy cultural norms and take to the waves. Sambe has been coaching girls from her community, encouraging them to develop the physical and mental strength needed to ride waves and break the mold in a society where many expect them to stick to traditional roles like cooking, cleaning and marrying young. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Simon, thank you. And now time for sports news. Here's Ayotunde Balogu. Thanks, Olumide. Former Chelsea FC striker Didier Drogba has been declared ineligible to contest next month's Ivory Coast Football Federation presidential election. According to the Electoral Commission, Drogba failed to meet a number of conditions in its eligibility criteria. His bid was rejected as two of the names he submitted as sponsors were ruled not to have the necessary authority to do so. Meanwhile, it appears President Donald Trump is still not a fan of the NBA and has described the league as a political organization 
with bad TV ratings after its boycott in solidarity with those protesting the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Since the NBA restarted its pandemic-interrupted season, courts have had Black Lives Matter painted on them, and many players have worn jerseys with social justice slogans. I don't know much about the NBA protest. I know their ratings have been very bad because I think people are a little tired of the NBA, frankly. Uh, but I don't know too much about the protest. But I know their ratings have been very bad, and that's too, that's unfortunate. They've become like a political organization, and that's not a good thing. I don't think that's a good thing for sports or for the country. One, a Formula One world champion Lewis Hamilton is standing with U.S. sports stars boycotting events to fight racism but does not think him skipping a race will have an effect. Basketball, baseball and football games have been postponed in the U.S. after police shot an unarmed black man, James Blake, seven times in the back on Sunday in Wisconsin. While Hamilton said he was really proud of those involved and that he was trying to do what he can over there. And that's wrap in Sports News. I'm Ayo Tunde Balu. And the main news again, former Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Akumi Adeshino, today promised to work towards five development priorities for Africa after he was re-elected President of the African Development Bank. The high fives include, amongst others, Light Up and Power Africa, Feed Africa, and Industrialize Africa. Meanwhile, President Mohamedou Buhari has encouraged him to be steadfast to better the lives of Africans. Also today, the federal government postponed the resumption of international flights till September the 5th, the change in date, according to the government, is due to logistics. And Hurricane Laura hit the U.S. state of Louisiana today, causing flash floods, severe damage to lives and property. That's it on the News at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Olumide Macaulay.